been a good seminar so far. I've learned quite a few things myself. Uh, for one, I'm very conscious of my slides now. Uh, I am confident that I have italicized and underlined things in there. So I need you to visualize. When you see something in italics so or when you see something underlined, think bold. Okay? Um, embracing literacy. It's, an, it's a pet topic of mine. I, I'm quite interested in this. And I thought I should start by also telling you that I stand between you and lunch. So we will make this as painless as possible and enjoy ourselves as much as we can. Um, I'll begin with a recount. I'll tell you how I came about with this topic. The title of my presentation is Embracing Literacy When Literacy is Like a Porcupine. Now, if this came about, I was reading a story to my four-year-old. And the title of the story is, How Do You Hug a Porcupine? And in this story, you have these children, and they're going around hugging animals. They're hugging small animals, big animals, fast animals, slow animals. But they're all stumped when it comes to, how do you hug a porcupine? And then it got me thinking. Because for many of our learners, literacy is like a porcupine. It's a thorny issue. And I mean, at the recent IDA conference, we had the good fortune of meeting up with people like Rod Nicholson. And they're telling us that they're waiting for the day the CEOs tell headhunters, we want dyslexics. Go find the dyslexics, we want them in our company. Right? So we're waiting for that day to happen. But it doesn't mean that their current struggles are any less real. So can our dyslexic learners embrace literacy? So we started out by asking some questions. We had 58 students and we asked them the first question, what subject do you like? Anyone want to guess what their pet subject was? Okay, I think I'm going to surprise quite a few of you. Maths, mathematics came out to be their most favorite subject. Highest number at 19. A very close second, science at 18. A distant third. English at seven. So out of 58 students, seven students said they liked English, which loosely translates to about 12%, which means 88% of the learners we spoke to didn't quite like English. So naturally, we asked the question, why? And we had some interesting answers. It's hard to write. It's very hard to write compositions and essays. It's so complex. It's a difficult language to communicate with. That was one. And then you have comprehension, a very complex process in itself. You must be able to read. You must be able to activate prior knowledge. You must have the vocabulary. You must know what the question is asking for. And then you've got to communicate the answer correctly. Tricky. Reading, ah, one student actually said that the very thought of reading gave her a headache. Don't even talk about trying to read. Yeah. This one is very interesting to me. You can't study for it. When I was in school, that was a good thing about English. <laughs> you didn't have to study for it. But for our learners, not being able to prepare, revise, and study for a subject is actually a difficult thing. It makes it harder for them to succeed at that subject. Cannot spell, yes. English is a complex language. It's not very transparent, it's pretty opaque. Cannot pronounce words. We've got words borrowed from several languages. And so pronunciation is not all that straightforward either. Too many rules. You can't do it this way. You can't do it that way. You have to do it this way. And some just said, difficult. It's a difficult subject. So. Can we then help our learners embrace literacy? We come to the main question. This is the book. How do you hug a porcupine? So before I propose some solutions, I thought I'd give you some context. The MOE Aided DS Literacy Program, or MAP, is the main literacy program offered by the DAS. And since its inception in 1993, we've seen about 11,000 students. And currently, we have a cohort of about 2, uh, sorry, 2,700 students. Now, the MAP program is based on UK, US, and local guidelines. By that, we mean we follow the National Reading Panel's guidelines, the Rose Report's suggestions, 
as well as the professional practice guidelines and on, on what would be a useful and effective intervention program for our learners. We have a comprehensive integrated curriculum, comprehensive because it covers a range of topics such as phonemic awareness, phonics, vocabulary, oral language. We look at um, grammar, writing, reading fluency, comprehension. And it's integrated because a learner at any stage in the program will encounter all of these components. And they will be taught all of this. We're looking at technology as a tool to make our learners independent and confident. We're also based on the Autumn Gillingham approach and the principles behind the approach. And more recently, the IDA has said that such approaches fall under a structured literacy program, which we therefore fit into as well. So, our question then. The DAS map offers a language-based intervention. And if only 12% of our students like the language, what's the possibility that our students like the DAS, right? And we were surprised. 51 out of the 58 students said, yes, we like the DAS, we like math. If you add in those who said it's okay, we've got about 55. 55 out of 58 students. So again, naturally we asked, how come? Why? It's fun. Many students said that the teachers were very engaging. They made lessons very relevant. And they used games for reinforcement of in, uh, information. They felt like they were being helped. What they were learning in the classrooms at the DAS helped them at their, at their schoolwork, built their confidence. They were in an empathetic environment. People understood them. The peers in their classroom understood them. They felt that they were always learning something new. And that gives them a sense of empowerment. It's peaceful. No pressure, no anxiety. We don't give homework, we don't do exams. So it's a peaceful environment. And I just had to put this one in as well. Because two students said they like the DAS because we give them free water and it's air conditioned. So Matt, therefore, with the success it's had, with the, just the students enjoying the classes, can propose some solutions on how we might want to up the porcupine. One, to know them well. And I've used this image of a magnifying glass to demonstrate how closely we need to know our students. We've got to see them as unique. They're unique individuals with unique needs, strengths, and abilities. And we need to understand that they might be different. We have to make knowledge and learning theirs. As Ashraf has mentioned, it's owning something. And they need to own what they've learned. That's like giving them a personalized gift with a gift tag saying, this is meant for you. It's about working through play. It's about having fun while learning. And it's about valuing the almost, the near hits. It's not about the target, but how close you come to the target and how that means that you can better yourself to reach to the target. So let's go into each one in a little bit of detail. Let's talk about diagnostic assessments to know them well. Well, in the DAS, in order for you to, learn your, uh, to understand your learner best, you first depend on a psychological report, which gives you the initial formal understanding about the student. And that's coupled with what we call curriculum-based assessments. And these curriculum-based assessments have been chosen specifically because it links directly to the curriculum that's covered in the DAS. And at the same time, it's a non-competitive environment for our dyslexic learners. It enables our learners to challenge themselves based on their own achievements rather than to challenge themselves with peers and classmates, which may not be necessarily a fair way to evaluate how well they've been doing. But apart from the initial profiling, a student will continue to evolve and therefore constant progress monitoring becomes critical. 
You've got to constantly understand where your learner is at so that your lesson and the program is suited for him. And then we talk about seeing them as unique. Each learner has a unique combination of strengths, needs, talents, etc. And we need to cater to that unique personality. So while we might keep our groups small, you'd also notice that differentiation is something that has to happen in every classroom. And so you will see that teachers would be um, supporting learners differently. With the clear profiles that are provided by the curriculum-based assessment, and by setting smart targets, which of course mean that they are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. Making it theirs. Now, the DAS and MAP has a, a curriculum that's based on, on a conceptual framework. So conceptual categorization of knowledge and skills enables students to store information um, and then retrieve this information easily. So for example, when you bring up a topic for the first time and you talk about the topic, when you link that topic with something that already exists, a student is able to place that information and therefore retrieve that information quite easily. It's also about making information concrete. Many of the things we teach our learners are quite abstract. So let's look at this example. We tell our children, when you come to a polysyllabic word, split them up into syllables because it's easier to read and it's easier to spell. Now, children may not understand that. I mean, they may see no value in it. So you might want to bring an orange into the classroom. Tell the child, challenge the child. I want you to eat this entire orange by itself. Just take the orange and eat it as a whole. Now, they might try, and I would be very frightened if they succeed, but they will try. And when they find it a little bit difficult to do, you can say, all right, then now tell me, how would you eat this orange? And they will tell you, oh, we'll just have to cut it up. So when you break that orange up into smaller pieces, you're able to eat the entire orange. And that's the same thing for syllabication. And you create that link for that student. And the student can therefore say, ah, I now see the value in something like syllabication. Now, I've got a video of a very dear colleague, and when you do see her later, you can say hi. This is an example, uh, I'm not gonna show you the entire video, but an example of how a concept can be taught and made concrete. Oops. Okay, Alifa, I'm gonna teach you a new sound today, okay? Now, this is a new sound. The letters are O and I, and together they make the sound OI. Can you repeat? Oi. Very good. Can you trace for me three times on the table? O I OI. O I OI. O I OI. O I OI. Okay, very good. Now the letters are O I and the sound is OI, right? Okay, this is what you call a vowel team. Okay, how many vowels do you see here? Two. Correct. So together they form a team. Now you know Batman and Robin, right? They are a team. So can you separate Batman and Robin? Cannot. So same thing here, you don't separate the vowels. Okay, so this is a vowel team and where do you find it? You find it in the beginning or middle of words. Okay, where do you find this? Beginning or in the middle of words. Okay, so your keyword is coin. What's your keyword? Coin. Okay, so when you think of the word coin, where do you find this oi sound? In the middle. In the middle, right? C-O-I-N is in the middle. Okay, so keyword is coin, position, beginning or middle of words. Okay, so just to recap, you can see that she mentioned what the concept was, and that's to enable the, the student to put that information in the right place. And she also made it concrete by talking about Batman and Robin, which is something that that child will understand. Now, the next thing we have, we suggest, is working through play. And many of our students have already said that one of the best things about the DAS is that it's fun. Games are a great way to reinforce and summarize learning. And at the same time, it's multisensory. It lends itself naturally to the visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and the tactile. So let me give you an example of an activity that can be fun. Um, I hope it's fun. Now, what I need you to do is guess what I, what am I, basically, what, I, what is this? I am brown, savory, 
sticky skewer. You guys are hungry, right? Yeah. So yes, satay. Now this is an example of an activity that can be fun. Can you imagine four or five kids coming up with their own riddles? And at the same time, this is an ideal opportunity to talk about adjectives. Describe the food. Use your senses. And in this fun way, you get to reinforce concepts that you've taught. And it could lead to a write-up on, you know, uh, describe your favourite food. It could lead to a, a discussion about why is that your favourite food. Now we also know about, I think this is um, quite a useful slide in that it tells us quite clearly why the visual, auditory, kinesthetic and tactile is the best way to learn. Because 10% of what we hear, we retain. 30% of what we hear and see, we retain. 40% of what we hear, see and say, we retain. So it keeps increasing the more you add your um, learning modalities. And of course, 70 to 100% of what you hear, see, say and do we retain. So that's what we're targeting for. Yeah. And this one, the last of our suggestions, valuing the almost. Many of the things we expect our learners to do is very challenging, um, especially for, when it comes to literacy tasks. These are challenging activities. And what we therefore need to do is appreciate the effort that goes in to doing these things. And even though they may not hit the target, they may not reach the aim, it is in recognising and embracing the near win that a child continues to see that they can constantly better themselves. There is room for improvement when we value the near hits. Take for example, athletes, um, runners. Yeah? Um, a bronze medalist and a silver medalist may not have met their aim but it gives them an opportunity to better themselves and improve and it could be that their personal best is better than a gold medal the following year. Yeah? So valuing the near miss or the almost. So what we're proposing is that we should light the candle rather than curse the darkness. When we discuss this with our educational therapists, most of them see that a lot of our students make academic progress. And if academic progress is not immediately apparent, self-confidence is. The, the willingness and the courage to tackle literacy tasks becomes apparent. And of course, um, we've also had the opportunity to talk to some students who have graduated. And this is what they've said. They've said that the classes are exciting and lively, helps me, keeps me interested, these are things that we therefore have to do in order to make our learners embrace literacy. We've got to keep things, we have to be kind, forgive mistakes, and we have to learn to teach, we have to teach them um, how to move from wrong to right. In a book, um, The Dyslexic Advantage, the authors are confident and assure you that if our learners do the following, they will see success. Persistence in tasks. To work using proven therapies, evidence-based support. To use technology which levels the playing field. To pursue support and guidance and to be your own advocate, to teach your learners to fight for themselves and to advocate for themselves, to set goals, to never stop believing that they can improve and be a better version of themselves, and to optimize their own strengths. And of course, this comes initially with the guidance and support of somebody else, but through that support, they will understand what their strengths are and work towards um, improving themselves. And therefore, disability is the inability to see ability. We all have such abilities. So, coming to the close, we're saying, at last, hooray, it's finally time. This is how you hug a porcupine. Carefully. In every sense of the word, we need to know the student, see the student as unique, make learning his own, play with him, and value his almost. Now with that, I thank you. I will not keep you from lunch. And if there's any questions, please free to email me. Thank you.